This talks about Python for educa educators and basically how I've used Python in the classroom and then some other examples. Uh, about myself, uh, I'm a retired uh, teacher at Columbus Public Schools and I taught automotive technology uh, including computer controls from 1980 to 1995. Uh, and then I ca taught computer technology subjects from 1995 to 2010, including Linux Plus, where I came to believe that Python was the best programming language. I've also taught Visual Basic and Java as a beginning language, and I also uh, developed my own learning management system that I use in the classroom in C Sharp. So, I'm more of a polyglot or somebody that uses a lot, have used a lot of different languages, but not at a uh, seriously deep level. Uh, and then, of course, you know, MA, computer science and education. And recent experience, uh, I just want to emphasize this. I, I taught an after school setting last year, and what they had the students do, uh, they used GIMP, which was a graphics writing program, Audacity, which is uh, sound editing program, Windows Movie Maker, making movies, uh, HTML and CSS, which you do web pages. So with web pages, they used graphics and Audacity. Then they used WordPress and Joomla. WordPress, you do your own blog. Joomla is a site where you can uh, have a number of people sign in. And if an organization needs a site, Joomla is a good way to do it. And then they use Scratch, Alice programming languages, which are uh, good languages for students, uh, especially Scratch is especially good for uh, students in the first six years of uh, school. Uh, Alice is a little more difficult. And then they went to Greenfoot Java, which is a um, framework or a, a set of, uh, a set of uh, well, framework is basically an easier way to learn Java because it does some of the hard stuff for you. And then App Inventor, from, which is now being uh, minded by MIT, Massachusetts Institute of Technology. And finally, Finch Robots, which that's a Finch Robot right there on this table, it, right here, which is, is an inexpensive robot that can be used programming. And they use it with a Java language. And I guess one of the main thrust of my t talk is, you know, because this is a Python, students have to learn all these tools. I mean, the, this was organizationally set up right from uh, being simple to complex because you know, you're using sound and then you can use it in each one of these programs. You can take a, a sound, uh, a wave file or a sound file and put it into Scratch. And you can do that into Greenfoot or you can actually use that in Finch, Finch Robots, but each one of these tools are a little bit different. And another thing I do is I create educational videos on YouTube uh, for Ubuntu open source and free software, but uh, the main thrust I want to point out is that all of a sudden you've got all these tools, now which one's the best? And uh, today, the state of computer science education. Uh, it's not really emphasized in schools. It's not a core subject. It's, there's no tests for it that students have to pass. So it's just a basically catch as can, catch as catch can. Uh, some students are turned off. A lot of students are turned off by it. There are some students that are excited by it. Uh, it's basically seen as being mainly for nerds. It's too hard. And many kids, especially urbans, are stuck in the shallow end of the pool. And a lot of urban schools will use PowerPoint or uh, word processing uh, programs and say, okay, this is technology education, instead of actually going through and trying to teach some kind of computer program, computer science. Basically, if it's got a computer, it's uh, computer science or computer tech. Now, the main thrust from ACM, uh, Association for Computer Machinery, uh, along with the CSTA, Computer Science Teachers Association, they have, are trying to uh, focus on changing this emphasis on just using a computer and doing whatever with it into having something called computer, computational thinking. 
They've taken the lead on introducing computer science to high school teachers using the concept of compu computational thinking. And it's not only high school teachers, it's also uh, all the way K through 12 education. Uh, computational thinking revolves around problem solving using a problem solving methodology as a learning tool. And it demonstrates how to solve problems using computational thinking for other disciplines, ties in with STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math. For example, if you're doing biology and you have a, a, a problem where different species are competing for the same resources, this would be a great thing to set up with computer science. However, uh, like I say, it's not really done that much, but this is what the CSTA and ACM emphasizes as compu computational thinking. Uh, one model that they're really pushing, and I've used this, is called exploring computer science. Now, I was a high school teacher, so it's a grades 9 to 12 model curriculum developed for urban Los Angeles schools. And it really, it works because it, students do get involved with this. And the six parts of this are human-computer interaction, problem-solving, algorithms. Uh, you know, you give them a candy bar and tell them how many, what's the fastest way to split it into uh, separate parts. If somebody wants some of this information, uh, I'll give you a site where you can, a after the end, I'll give you a site where you can uh, pick it up uh, because the CSTA does have a site where you can get all these curriculum materials. Uh, web design, use HTML, CSS, Flash, and JavaScript. Introduction to programming, and this is a scratch programming language from MIT. Uh, computing data, data analysis, R deducer, which is a uh, large data analysis methodology, I, which I have not used, all the other things I've used. And uh, robotics, they use Lego Mindstorm NXT, and I think they just use the uh, basic uh, programming language. Unfortunately, it doesn't mention or use Python. Uh, because Python can do a lot of these things, uh, can, can go in, and so you're constantly having to learn new tools for each section, for each six-week section. Some of these may be five weeks, some of them seven weeks, but uh, they go throughout a whole school year. Uh, K through eight computer science, uh, CSTA has K through eight computer science, building a solid foundation. Uh, there are other countries that are doing the same kind of thing. England is doing the same kind of thing. Uh, computational thinking, problem solving, emphasizes uh, those kinds of things. And also the ACM, Association for Computer Machinery, and IEEE, is, I always forget that, electrical engineers, electrical and, uh, um, what? Electrical and electronic <laughs> engineers. Uh, they, have, they have a lot of research papers on using uh, Python as a first language, uh, which I've read uh, and when I was working on my master's, but uh, they're not demonstrated in any of these uh, current uh, curriculum materials. So uh, here's a real life example that uh, I had to deal with. I was teaching a Linux Plus class, Linux Plus class and the students had to learn the VI editor. Uh, if anybody has used editors or if you're familiar with it, it, it's not that easy to learn. And as a consequence, the students say, okay, why do I got to learn this? Uh, I'm going to use Word. Uh, you know, the constraints are students, why they should go back to a text editor if they've been using all the wonderful features in Microsoft Word. And the other constraint was that students did had no or very limited programming ex experience. And the solution I came up with was uh, introduce students to chatbots and have them solve the problem of writing a chatbot. Uh, once students use a web-based chatbot, students seem to get excited about it. So what is a chatbot? Program that attempts to mimic human language interaction. You'd be surprised. Uh, I had the, the gamut of 
uh, reactions I get from students. Some students actually get angry at the chat bot if it says things. Other students sit there and try and think what's going on behind the scenes. Uh, there's a lot of uh, different reaction. Now their assignment, you don't have to write a chat bot that talks everything, encompasses all the humanity. For example, uh, one the first kind of uh, talking uh, program that would talk to you, uh, I guess that's fairly famous, is a program called ELIZA. And it would say, how are you feeling? And if you say bad, and it would say, why are you feeling bad? It would just take your, and kind of feed it back to you and kind of make you think it's, it was a human being. Uh, and it can be done as simply as if else, or can be more complex using lists or dictionaries, which are hash tables or uh, a database. Um, and I just did it on the simple thing and basically asked the students to just pick a topic. Here's an example of a uh, program. Now, because we don't have web, uh, I just have short video clips on things, and this is a short video clip. Oops. This is a short video clip. This is a sample of a student program. It says, hello, friend. I'm your friend, Bot Charles. Answer non-caps, please, or it will make me sick. Question is, what is your name? Type in something like John. It's nice to meet you, John. It picks up the John. How are you feeling today? Put in good. Ask good to hear. The question is, has your day been good so far? Yes, no response. We'll put in yes. That's good. I hope it ends good as well. Do you like sports? We'll put in yes. And great. Which is your favorite? Lacrosse, football, baseball, or basketball? And we'll try it. Type in lacrosse. And me too. Now this is the same chat bot, and just to show you what a student can do with a very simple program, uh, put in some different answers. Hello friend, I'm your friend bot Charles. Answer non-caps please. And what is your name? In this case I'll put in Joanne. And it's nice to meet you, Joanne. How are you feeling today? Bad. Oh, I see. Different answer. Has your day been good so far? No. Well, tomorrow's another day. Do you like sports? No. Oh, come on. You have to like a sport. Which is your favorite? Cross football, baseball, or basketball? Put in none. And you must be a tennis player, so you've got a chatbot that can produce different answers and all we're using here all the student is using is uh, if then else uh, statements Oops. let me get back to that anyway uh, I don't know if you can see okay I don't know if you can see this on the screen. It's not, it's not necessary to look at the code uh, perfectly, but basically I just want to point out that, you know, if string feeling, else if string feeling equal bad, that's basically how this is written. So in a sense, take a, you know, they're written writing a certain chatbot, and I think I had to say they had to go through four levels of conversation or three or four, and, and the students were actually motivated to do this, and they tried these out on each other. Um, and that's one example, and here's a sports bot. Uh, again, this person, uh, just, you know, what kind of sports you like. It's not as well done as the other one. But again, you know, you're using the if, and print, and if, and else. And so you can get some kind of interaction, and, and you know, when you're working, and you get this straight from, the, with Python, you can get this straight from the command line. So, uh, you can, uh, uh, students can just use this real quickly, and they, they play these off on each other. And, uh, of course, by the time they turn it in, some of the words they use are changed. 
than what they did with each other. Okay, uh, why was Python the best solution? Easy to get started. Uh, compare what you have to do with a Python print statement compared with a Java print statement. Uh, with a Java print statement, you've got to instant write a class and then import some things. Uh, with Python, just simply say print from the command line. Uh, many natural languages, that's like English, they use indentation to tell you, okay, we got a new paragraph. And students are used to this indentation. And so when they look at a piece of code, they find it's Python is more easily readable than other programming languages. When someone first starting out, uh, it's free, line, works on Linux, Mac, Windows. Uh, and in my class, all students had their own Ubuntu virtual machine uh, with Python already installed. Uh, more reasons for type Python. It's uh, weakly typed. And basically what this means is uh, strong type declarations make for safer programs. Python would not be a good solution, may not be a good solution for a medical program. You might want to use a stronger, very strong type language like Ada or, you know, which is not in use very much, but except the military. But, uh, but the, these type declarations take up about a quarter to one third lines of code, so uh, get rid of that. You know, they don't have to, you know, work with that at this level right now. Uh, your interactive prompt allows students to experiment easily, try things out. In four lines, one can print out a web page. And these four lines, basically, uh, I've got a short video on that. I'm not, so, it's under a minute. Oh, my fault. My fault, I forgot that. I brought my own speakers, but I didn't have this set in. Now, it's not necessary to take a, you know, read this. Oh, touch screen? Oh, my fault, here. Okay, it's not necessary to, you know, pick up on this assignment. I'll go back over those four characters in the video those four lines. In creating a search engine, one of the first things you have to do is to access a web page. Here I'm using the interactive prompt to print out the first 1,000 characters of the chatbot assignment. I import a library, I uh, open the page, I read the page, and then I print out the page. The first 1,000 characters. What's that? That's what that zero to one thousand. Python makes it easy to get started with uh, programs that may have to interact with other programs, like in this case a web server. Okay, so basically uh, interactive, and you can basically interactive, uh, and you can actually. Uh, your students get a lot of feedback that quickly. And it's got a quick edit uh, uh, debug cycle. So uh, recently uh, I became familiar with something called Udacity. It's an online university uh, and offers several free online courses in typical university format. And all or most of their CS courses, computer science courses, use Python. Python problems are presented through an online Python interpreter and graded when the code is submitted. Uh, the entry levels course, CS101 is building a web search engine and uses mainly the standard Python library problem. It's, also, it's very problem solving oriented. And I'm going to have, this video clip includes two things. One, it just kind of shows you some different Python courses uh, and all their courses are pretty much done in Python the last time I checked. Uh, and it shows you how the interactive uh, Python editor works and it actually shows you, you know, that you can get graded right away on something. Udacity offers online classes, which are, uh, and most of the 
computer classes are use Python. As of last time I checked, they all use Python. Uh, some sample classes, software testing, artificial intelligence, uh, logic, discrete mathematics, web application engineering. So you can see that there, there, there's a lot of different classes currently being offered. A beginning class being offered, which is how to build a search engine, is Introduction to Computer Science, CS101. Uh, they like to bring in speakers on video, like in this case is a Sergey Brin. And the units include homework, and they last about seven weeks. In this short section, I'm going to show how uh, Udacity works and how they actually uh, use Python in an online setting. In this case, this assignment right here just simply asks you to finish the page ranking algorithm and add a few lines of code. And I've solved the problem here in uh, using PyDub because it's a lot easier and a lot quicker to work uh, if you're working from your own computer rather than working for online. And so I'll simply copy the page here. Copy. I'm not going to go explain everything because. Um, that's not the purpose of what I'm doing in this uh, demonstration or talk. And we'll simply paste, make sure that I'm uh, in the right, uh, got everything correctly. And then I'll simply run my code. And it says working, execution successful. And you'll see that right here I've got gives a ranking in a page or, or P, uh, I'm sorry, a page URL and the ranking of that page. In this case, we're using a cache as opposed to uh, going out to the web. But as you can see uh, from the get page, or here we are, get page URL, you go to the cache and that's it. But uh, you can actually go out get this information. And now that I, I seem to have gotten the same answers both places, uh, I can simply submit and I'm told whether I got it right or uh, wrong. I think this is a very, uh, you know, very neat way of, uh, of trying to learn Python. I wish I had the ability to, to do something like this uh, off a server in my classroom. Okay, the uh, uh, thing is, why Python for a search engine? You build on previous knowledge. You don't, excuse me? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm not used to this. Okay, why Python for a search engine? You build on previous knowledge. You've got a large standard library with Python. That's where you get lists and dictionaries, which are hash tables to allow for data storage. Uh, you can also import additional web parsing to libraries if you want to go and really make it better. Beautiful soup. And you can also use SQL libraries uh, or data query language libraries. Uh, just basically, I'm going to talk about Python games. Students like games. Once you've learned Python, you can import modules to build games. Now, in that course I taught, students could build some, a game in scratch, but then they had to learn a completely different language to build a, a game in, with Greenfoot Java, or even do something in uh, App Inventor. When teaching about games, you have to include games that might appeal to girls. Now, everything can be a first-person shooter. That's where one person shoots the bad guys, and imported libraries allow students to expand Python and create graphical games. And I basically, uh, because like I said, I guess it's going. Well, and basically, I just wanted to show two different game modules, Pi Games and uh, Panda 3D. Well, that's a it. 
it's got a, a it's got a full list here. And let's take a look here at, at Pi Game. It's one of the oldest and uh, is mature and has documentation as well as tutorials. In the tutorial section, you'll see that we've got online books, general tutorials, Pi Game. Tutorials on specific topics, learning Python, and of course you've got even have non-English tutorials. Another source of information right here is in the projects. In the projects, you've got you can uh, click. Uh, I'm sorry, you can uh, take a look at uh, perhaps what different uh, people have written. For example, here we would have like say Dodge Cars by Suhas. First, we can go to the source, and we can see you've got a resource file, which probably has a lot of uh, PNG and JPG or graphics files. And if you want to take a look at what the source code looks like, in this case, uh, you've got something here like 346 lines, and you've got you can just go down there and actually take a look at the source code. So, uh, one game uh, tutorial that uh, I thought was very good is Daniel Lorenzo's series of Pi Game tutorials on creating a simple worm game. It starts off very slow. You simply go and uh, put in user, you know, Python import Pi Game and set up a display in while one or true, you pass. And then it goes on from there in tutorial one and you know by tutorial seven you're drawing more lines and it gives tries to explain to the student what they're actually doing when they're uh, writing the code unfortunately he only wrote nine tutorials uh, but this is a good way for students to get started and i found that i could use this as an extra credit assignment and then just simply answer students questions when they I had additional questions. For more advanced games, one library that is becoming more popular is Panda 3D. Panda 3D is a open source game engine um, with three dimensional rendering developed by Carnegie, well, it's actually developed by Disney and is currently being supported by Carnegie Mellon, but it is open source. Now, while I've never used uh, Panda 3D, uh, I've talked to other educators who have, and they're finding that it's an intriguing program, to, and they'd like to figure out a way to actually uh, incorporate that into their uh, education, uh, into the teaching process. Uh, there, are, it doesn't have as many resources as uh, Pi Games. You've got a manual and some sample applications. The manual has a uh, uh, tutorial and there isn't as much information on the internet but uh, this is something that personally uh, I plan to pick up or personally try to get involved in in the future if I've got some time and I've got a page here with uh, game links I think we'll put this up uh, why Python for games uh, may not be the best framework for but it allows students to build on previous Python knowledge. Oh. Uh, why Python for games may not be the best framework uh, for games, but allows students to build on previous knowledge to go further. Uh, and you have a variety of different game engines, uh, libraries that you can uh, import. I just covered two of the most uh, popular. And one of the things I had to do is a Finch robot for Python, and this is it uses uh, Jython, which is Python integrated with Java platform, and the software is available at FinchRobot.com. That the Finch robot is this right here, and it costs about a hundred dollars uh, for thing and all the programming interfaces, and it's designed to be an educational robot. Uh, for example, I'm just showing you 
this is the entire code for, I guess my computer restarted. Yeah, I guess I shouldn't use uh, Windows. But this is a computer I actually, uh, if I'm tutoring or something like that, I'll just take out and allow students to use. And it's, it's about an eight or ten year computer, so. I had everything set up and I just wanted to uh, run one, I'll just run one little uh, program here. But basically it sets up a Finch. It can say something, it uh, uses the actual computer program. Uh, it, there are other languages besides Python, but this, even Lego Mindstorms right now is using Python. It's uh, USB, and this is going to take a while to set up, so I'm going to continue going on, because otherwise I'm going to run out of time. And I just set up three programs, dance, it just moves and says something. And Wanderer, actually it will go... Uh, find an object, back off, and maybe say something. In this case, I have a defective one, uh, an older model, but the newer models work better. And the third program I had was, actually goes out to the internet, in this case, picks up a weather and tells you what the weather is in a certain town. In this case, Honolulu. And that's the entire code for, what you're seeing there is the entire code for all these little, short little programs. So you can get going fairly quickly. So, for example, okay, um, thank you. Oh, it has really messed up here. Well, we'll see if it hooks up or not. So I'm going to continue going on and go back, go back to that. Uh, so basically, I'm going to sum up uh, why problem solving. Uh, why is, is that becoming the main thing for teaching computer science rather than it used to be when I was going learning computer science? Well, today we have to learn variables, uh, they functions, lists, uh, hash tables. Now the emphasis is on the problem and what kind of methodology, how are you going to fix it? How are you going to, how, how are you going to solve it? It basically increases motivation rather than spending uh, two weeks on uh, something called lists or uh, a week on variables or something like that. And of course the problem must be of the appropriate uh, cognitive challenge to motivate students. Can't be too easy, cannot be too hard, so you have to uh, find a problem that will work. For example, chatbots work, building a search engine work. Now if you're a teacher and you have your students build a search engine, you might worry a little bit about what they call the DNS or uh, denial of service attacks because if everybody goes to the school web, has their search engine go to the school website, then the school website crashes. Uh, that's why in that instance I showed we used a cache rather than an actual website. Though I also demonstrated how to go to a website in, in the uh, short uh, uh, interactive thing. Uh, problem solving tool constraints. Now if you saw when I was doing the tutoring and even in, in, in the, some of the curriculums, you constantly have to learn new tools, programming languages or software. Can, and it takes a additional cognitive resources or, you know, it takes additional thinking. You've got to figure out how to do all those. You have to be able to figure out when the students have problems with them. Uh, how are you going to fix it? And from both uh, students and teachers. And Python is a solution for this. 
It's simple to learn. It can be, it can be very complex with its large standard library and, and you know, additional libraries. Uh, seems a good fit if you're just having a standard working solution so you can work on the problems as opposed to constantly learning new specialized tools. Uh, there are programming languages that work better for making web pages than Python. Uh, you know, but you can, like I say, it's, it's, a, it's like a Swiss Army knife. And I really recommend it for, you know, teaching language. Uh, so why Python? Readability for non-programmers, the indentation. Uh, it's free and multi-platform, runs on different things. Easy to get started, very simple, write a hello world program, and the pseudocode, and I really haven't talked about it. One of the things that you have to teach students to do is to write an algorithm for a program. And not all programs have algorithms, but an algorithm is a series of steps. Uh, and you teach students to write a series of steps on how to solve a problem. And it's very kind of easy to translate that code to uh, uh, Python. Uh, a lot easier than some of the other languages because you don't have to worry about semicolons. You just you just write it out and you just uh, you know just get the indentation, hanging indentation, and then you can keep working from there. Uh, you've got an interactive prompt that you can try something out real quickly. It's got a fairly small basic language, just basic parts, and it's got a standard library that has storage things, lists and hash tables called dictionaries in Python, and you've got a ton of library imports. Uh, that's like Pygame, uh, Panda 3D, I've showed that. Uh, more Y Python, weekly type, less code for students to key in, worry about. Uh, makes it easier to learn the language. It's a dynamic language, basically. It doesn't compile, and you can just run it, and you have a quick edit debug cycle. Uh, it's got a simple and powerful string manipulation library. Uh, string is, you know, text. And your functions predominantly turn a new object. Uh, basically, most of the time your function will return a new object and erase the old object, make a new object. Basically, this makes it easier to find, uh, track down some bugs uh, when you're first getting started. And, uh, any questions? Now I'm going to try this again here and see if I can get this, and then we'll, I'll ask, see if anybody has any questions. Hello, Python. <laughs> Doesn't have a sensor for not to fall off the table. <laughs> now some of you that have uh, uh, used uh, Lego know that there's a sensor there that would keep it off supposedly keep it on, on the table. It's got, uh, I don't know, I should go to the site and I'm not out here to sell this, you know what I mean, I'm just here to demonstrate that you know, this thing works. It's got a um, sensor that if it hits an object, uh, if you get too near an object, it'll, it'll back up and do that, uh, that kind of thing. Um, and because I don't have internet connections uh, right here, I, I can't run the program that actually, you know, has it goes out and find uh, the weather in Honolulu, Hawaii. Uh, but uh, this is one thing, and it uses the computer speaker, but does have a little small sound that will make its tweets, and you can, you know, change the colors, and there's all, you know, a little simple programming thing. So it's, 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 it's less expensive than some of the other alternatives. So, anybody got any questions? Yes. Has to stay hooked up by USB at all times. That's where it gets its power from. And it, you know, program runs into it. It's not stored. Like, uh, I know with Lego, you got the, the brick. Okay, this is the, the Lego, like I say, is uh, 250 bucks. This one starts at under 100. And they're trying to get it cheaper all the time. Um, and Finch Robot, F-I-N-C-H, uh, was developed by Tom Lowry's at uh, Carnegie Mellon. I, I went to a class of his once. It's 
Tom Lowers from uh, Carnegie Mellon. Uh, I, thought, I think it's called Bird Brain Technology. <laughs> okay? And it, it has all kinds of um, languages that come with it. And th in this case, this uses, you know, I set it up with Python. And like I say, Python is, you can use that anywhere. Any other questions? Yes. Okay. Um, I got this from my, I, it's really, my students didn't get to this last time because I had all that long list of things and we never got to the Finch robot. I tried to convince my people that hired me to do the Finch, you know, to, to use Python and instead of all these things. We, we got rid of some of those things because that's what, that, that's what the curriculum called for. Uh, but, uh, um, none of that, but you know, I, I you know, so I, I did have a robotics club, and they tr have a track or follow you, and then they, you know, we had had a kick, find a ball, kick it. Uh, this is Lego, uh, but it, it wasn't using Python Lego at that time. Like, you know, maybe I should have. <laughs> right now, if I had a choice, I would just have them use Python Lego. Uh, but at that time, we used the, the regular graphical user interface. Yes? I'm sorry. Uh, okay, what do you want to do? Problem solve. What do you want? Uh, I, I, what I'm saying is learning Python? Programming? Um, you can start around eight. You might want to start with something like uh, scratch programming language first. Uh, and, and robotics, actually, something like this is geared more for a, uh, I think, more for a you know, high school student because you got to use a a, a language. You, know, you might try to you know, there's some simple Lego, you know, building a Lego thing. Uh, that you may know fifth sixth grades. I, I've seen fifth sixth graders working with this all you know and I've been to workshops where fifth sixth graders have been working with them and you know if you were doing one on one or something like that you know you can go a little further the only thing you have to consider is uh, what are your levels you're stepping back you know your, uh, your symbols you know can a student do something like algebra can they understand that X stands for a number and you have to kind of be aware of what's happening there, uh, you know. But you know, you can put something together and then make it move. Um, you know, one of the things they had was this thing's got a thing where you can actually have it spin on its rear wheels and uh, put a pen right here. And uh, Lego has the same thing, uh, but you know I, but you here you're using a you, you don't you're not using you use an actual python and i probably wouldn't use python for anyone below 6th grade personally it, excuse me 6th grade uh 12 12 a oh, number of students uh you have to set up your classroom how you want to you you have to design your classroom you have to take what resources you have you have a certain number of resources, you have certain objectives you want, need to accomplish, and you kind of have to match the two. I mean, it, you can, for example, you, like I showed, I want to show that search uh, engine thing. You can, they've done that class for, with 300,000 people. Uh, or, you know. Well, you, if you set something up like this, you, if you set, you know, like certain videos, education, where you have a question, go to the website, look at this video. You understand what I'm saying? You can actually manage more kids but where each kid comes in and you have to explain everything. Then, you know, it's smaller class size. You know, if you've got 50 kids, you can't go do it with 50 kids by yourself. You have to, you know, bring in somebody else or, okay, it's, 
you pick up a list of questions that they have to ask and then say and then make vi short video sections you know under you know five minutes or so on the answer to their questions yes yes that works the, the thing with teams is you have to uh, get your students used to working in teams and the sad part <laughs> Right, right. That, 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 that's right. And I've used Teams quite a, quite a bit, uh, you know, for certain projects, certain things, uh, you know, some, certain things I'll divide as individual. And basically, if you have to learn basic skills, I'll try and do that on an individual basis. If you're, you know, going to problem solving, Teams works great. Off the top of my head, I can't think of. Uh, you know, I know I've used Scratch and, okay, you have to design this or you have to design something to talk to an alien. Uh, any other questions? Yes? Uh, Whatever is available. <laughs> uh, okay, here, here's, the, here's, here's the thing. Here's the thing. You pick an IDE you're familiar with. Okay, like, for example, I use... In this case, I used the um, uh, PyDev, the, the, the Eclipse IDE. Okay, the reason. And then I can, I take that and then they would use a subset. You know, I pick what subset I want them to learn, not the whole thing. And the only reason I use the Eclipse is basically because Java, I use, do some things with Java, you, you know what I mean, but I, I you know, the, uh, you know, I've used VI. That was a demonstration. That was the IDE I used because that was part of the course. You pick it and you have to stick with it and, and just make sure it, it meets all your things. And if it is too heavy, you know, like I taught Visual Basic and they got that, that whole big of thing, uh, and you just pick certain things, you extract it, and make it simple for them. The Eclipse is free. Okay, uh, also, you know, uh, the uh, Microsoft, the uh, .NET is free also.